Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, for Christ is on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then sh shall ye also appear with him in glory. It's good to be here on this Lord's Day. We appreciate the good singing and the prayer this morning. And uh, thank you for the scripture reading Daniel Moses, who is now 10 years old as of yesterday. So glad and thankful to see our children make another year. Thank you for each and everyone here this morning. I want to commend Lydia King for coming forward Wednesday night and keep her in our prayers. And she strives as a young person to live the Christian life. And all of us to exhort one another and pray one for another in the Lord. Sometimes we might say, well, our affections are bound up in our children, and that certainly is as it should be. We remember what Judah said of Jacob's love for Benjamin, his youngest son, that his life is bound up in the lad's life. Genesis 44 and verse number 30. Indeed, our hearts and affections should be upon our children. But this morning, we want to raise the question, where is my heart and my affections? For as there is even a greater way that we should have our hearts and affections set upon God. We know that to say, well, I love God more than my children or my grandchildren, that's quite a statement. But yet the Lord said that if we don't love him first above all others, we're not worthy of him. In Matthew 10, verses 37 and 38, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Jesus said, the first and great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. And of course, the second is likened to it. He taught, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There in Mark 12, verse 30 and 31. We studied on Sunday morning recently in the book of James about Abraham and how that Abraham was one who obeyed God no matter what God told him to do. In James 2, verse 21 to 23, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. This, of course, has reference to the account in Genesis 22 when God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, up upon a mountain and offer him in sacrifice, that being Isaac. And Abraham was ready to follow through with it until God stayed him at the last minute. Abraham had passed the test of faith. And we can also read of this in Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19. Abraham was called the friend of God. Jesus teaches us to be his friend. We must obey whatever he commands us. In John 15 and 14, he said, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. And in John 14, 15, he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. It seems that many people, though, when it comes to their children or grandchildren, that's where they draw the line. That if it comes down, to they will have to oppose their children or disagree with them or condemn their lifestyle. That's the point where many people will compromise. I remember this several years ago regarding a preacher in the state of Virginia whose son became involved in the Crossroads Movement or what's later called the Boston or the Discipling Movement. 
And uh, this preacher, of course, didn't believe in that, but his son was dabbling in it, and he was asked to deal with it. And he said, you guys asked me to go against my family. In other words, he wouldn't really deal with it. This is an example of one who was not willing to put the Lord first in everything. Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But this morning as we deal with the question, where should our heart be? Jesus tells us where our heart should be. So many people in this life, and sadly even in the church, have a problem with material things, with money, <coughs> with earthly things. This is where their affections are. Constantly thinking on material things. And I believe that we do this more than we realize. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither the moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the question today is, where is my treasure? Is my real treasure in the bank, in my wallet, on paper somewhere? And, you know, you can lose that any time, by the way. Or is my treasure in heaven? Is that where my heart is? Is my heart in heaven with God? Paul tells them that it charges them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, which giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Abraham, again, was the one whose affections and heart was on heaven, even way back there in the patriarchal age. We read of him that he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11 and verse number 10. At this time, friends, I'd like to turn over to the book of uh, Philippians. There in the book of Philippians in the third chapter, verse 20 and 21, if we understand this idea of having our heart and affections in the right place, we understand this is what Paul is teaching here. <laughs> that what should be our real citizenship, the American Standard Version says here in verse 20, the King James says conversation, but the American Standard Version says our citizenship. Now there are people in this country that love this country. We do love our country, the United States of America. We are thankful for our citizenship. But there are people in this country now that don't love this country. And I'm not just talking about immigrants or people who've come across the border. Even some who are born and raised here don't love this country. They do not want to stand for the principles this country was founded upon. They do not appreciate the sacrifices made. And of course, in addition to that, we have many people in this country now that don't really care that much for our country. They just want material benefit. And I'm not saying everybody. We have some fine people who've come into this country from other lands. But we should love God and love heaven and love the church and love spiritual and eternal things. And Paul said here, for our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now this whole body we've got is not the glorious body that Paul's talking about. He refers to this body of the flesh as being a vile body. We may be young and healthy right now. We might be older and healthy as far as that goes. But eventually, some things are going to go with this body, aren't they? We know this body has its weaknesses and frailties. As uh, Brother Herkim over in Wells used to say, old age don't come alone. You know, friends, this old body is weak, isn't it? The flesh will pass away and the glory of man will pass away, Peter taught. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Now let's think about this question today. In keeping with our scripture reading this morning, if ye then be risen with Christ, reference to baptism, chapter 2, verse 12 of Colossians, if ye then be risen with Christ, set your affection on things above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, Paul taught. He said that we are to set our affections on things above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. 
Again, I'd like to repeat this. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Boy, that hits a lot of people, doesn't it? They have their affections on their possessions, their material things, their pleasures, the things of this world. Friends, too much we are involved in that. Paul warns against it. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When a person, uh, back then they would talk about a man being hidden in the earth. You know, when we are dead with Christ, is the idea here. We are hid with Christ. We died to the world to sin, to self. Galatians 2.20 and Galatians 6.14. We're to be dead to the world. We're to be crucified with Christ, that Christ might live in us, according to Colossians 2 and verse number 20. For ye are dead. You know, Christians are dead people. But yet, we're the most alive people. We're dead to sin, to self, and the world. But we're alive unto Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now, how can we look at this question, where are our affections today? Let's test that question by looking at some other questions. Let's see what the answer to that is, where is my heart? How do we treat things that are from above? How do we treat them? How do we deal with them? What is our relationship to them? For example, the Word of God is from above. How do we treat the Word of God? The church is from above, no doubt. The God of heaven instituted the church. How do we treat the church? What is our relationship to it? The worship of God, the plan and pattern, the worship of God came from above. How do we treat the worship of God? First of all, the Word of God. The gospel was brought down from heaven by the Holy Spirit, according to 1 Peter 1.12. Thus it came from heaven. In Psalm 119, verse 89, Thy word, O Lord, is settled forever in heaven. The word of God came from heaven. Do we love the word of God? Do we love the Bible? Do we love the scriptures? The man after God's own heart, David, Acts 13, verse 22, loved the word of God. He said, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Do we love the Word of God as David did? What about Jeremiah? He's another example of one who loved the Word of God. In Jeremiah 15 and verse number 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me, the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. We believe this to be a reference to the time that the law was found in the temple, in the repairance of the temple, and he said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. That doesn't mean that Jeremiah took the literal scroll upon which the scripture was written and ate it in his mouth and digested it. But there was a spiritual sense in which Jeremiah ate the word of God. The sense in which Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The sense in which Peter said that we should hunger after God's word like a baby hungers after the mother's milk. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. To hunger after God's word the way that Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Do we love the word of God? If we love the word of God, we will not be able to stay away from it. We will cherish it. We will carry a copy of the scriptures with us. We will obey it. We will talk about it. We will do as Paul said, and that the word of Christ will in us richly in all wisdom. Colossians 3, 16. We will be like the early disciples when the church was growing and spreading in Acts 8, 4. And they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. The word of God will be deeply embedded in our hearts. As Jesus taught in John the 14th chapter in verse 21, when he said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. The idea of having them is having them deep within us internally in our minds and our hearts and loving these commandments and doing them 
And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him, Jesus said. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, that is Judas, not Iscariot. Verse 22, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Is this not in harmony with what John said in 2 John 9? Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. When we truly love and keep and have Christ's word abiding deep within us, then the Father and the Son will be with us. And we will be in the Father and we will be in the Son. My friends, today are we like the noble Bereans in Acts 17, verse 11? Luke records these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. This is one reason the church in many places has gotten in the condition that it's in. People don't love their Bibles. They don't hold the Word of God close anymore. They're not studying their Bibles. 2 Timothy 2, 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, right in dividing the Word of truth. The Word of God will vivify us. It will give us strength and life as nothing else can. As Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. And the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two judges sword. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. The truth that dwelleth within us and shall be with us forever. John speaks of in 2 Timothy 2, 2. Uh, 2 John rather. In 2 Timothy 2, 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So first of all, where is my heart? How do I treat the word of God that is from above? If my heart is from above, then I will treasure the Word of God from above. Secondly, what about the church? Do we know that the church is from above? The builder of the church, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is from above. He said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. We know that the church of our Lord was planned and purpose and eternity in the vestibules of heaven. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse number 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. The church was planned in heaven, the seed, the word of God, the seed of the kingdom was brought down from heaven. And in order to be a faithful member of the church, we have to follow the word of God. Jesus said, every plant which my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Matthew 15, verse 13. That refers to all religious systems and organizations and bodies today, except the body of Christ, the church. But how do we treat the church? You know, some people treat the church like club membership. They drop in when they want to. They think they can just pay their dues every so often. And they'll be a good member. They're not dedicated. The Lord's church is not their life. The church has to be our life. The church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. The church that Christ loved and gave himself up for, according to Ephesians 5, 25. Like that song that we sometimes sing, I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode. Do we love the church of the living God, the house of God, 1 Timothy 3, 15? Do we treat it in a secondary manner, secondary to job or family or friends or hobby? At one time there was a wealthy man, and he was going about trying to find the right church. And he would go to a certain religious body and, and he would ask maybe the leader or the preacher, what will it cost me to be a member of this church or this religious body? <coughs> and almost inevitably, every time they would say, oh, it will cost you much, very little, maybe nothing. But one day, this wealthy man came across a gospel preacher. And he asked him, what will it cost me to be a member of this church? He said, it will cost you everything. 
And the man said, this is what I've been looking for. You know, friends, people who are sincere about going to heaven, they don't want pretense. They don't want convenience. They know that's not right. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. When one has the Lord's church first at heart, it will be seen in their presence and their attendance. Now, I know there are exceptions to this. We've got a good sister in Christ right now in the hospital that would be here today if she were at all able possibly to be here. She would be here. And sister Joanne, she's been here many times. She didn't feel like it. But I'm talking about people that are able to go to the services and don't. It will be seen in the way that we give. You know, I heard a story one time, it went something like this. I may have some of the details wrong, but the point is the same. One time a man's friend said to him, if you had a thousand bushels of wheat, would you give me half of it? Well, sure, I'd give you half. If you had 500 hogs, would you give me half of them? Well, of course I would. He said, if you had two hogs, would you give me half of them? He said, man, you know I got two hogs. <laughs> You know, there are some people that are always going to do these big things if and when I get this or this situation. But they don't take what little they've got or what they think is little and sacrifice that for the Lord. Paul said that God loved the cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse number 7. Jesus said, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. John 4, 34. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Jesus Christ came down from heaven to do a heavenly work, the will of God. He said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of Him that sent me. John 6, verse 38. Have you taken up your part in this heavenly cause? Are you involved in this work, continuing the work of Jesus Christ on this earth? But then last of all this morning, there's a third thing that is from heaven, and that is the true worship of God. Jesus taught the Samaritan woman in John 4, 23, that the Father seeketh true worshipers to worship Him. And in verse 24, he said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what a true worshiper is. A true follower, a faithful follower, who worships the right one, the true and living God in heaven, in spirit, sincerely, with the inward man, with the spirit, from the heart, and in truth, according to the truth of God's word. My friends, the worship of God came from heaven. Just as the tabernacle that Moses was instructed to make, according to Exodus 25 and 40, as used in Hebrews 8, 5, see that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. In like manner, we are to follow the Lord in heaven's pattern in worship. We are to hold fast the form or pattern of sound words, Paul said, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. This story was related several years ago about a congregation of the Lord's Church over near Jackson, Tennessee, in West Tennessee. A man came in on a Lord's Day morning. He'd been looking for the right church. The people were kind and friendly. The service was uplifting and it always appeared to be scriptural. And he left that day thinking, you know, I believe I found what I've been looking for. But he came back that night. And only about half the people came back for Sunday night worship. And he thought, you know, I'm not so sure. I've really found what I've been looking for. And I realize that we cannot uh, gauge whether a congregation is a true New Testament church or not simply by attendance or what people do, but our dedication level does speak loudly to other people. 
And we need to be assured that people are watching us. People are watching us. Our fellow Christians are watching us. What is our dedication level? In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, we are to provoke one another into love and to good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see that I approach it. We talked about David a while ago, a man who loved God and his word. David said, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Isn't that a great and powerful statement in Psalm 42, 1? Do we love God like that? Like a thirsty deer running through the woods seeking for water? Do we thirst for God like that? Do we desire to be close to God? James said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's a promise, James 4, 8. The same David said in Psalm 122, 1, I was glad when they came, said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. David was gladsome and joyful when it came time to worship God. Is that my attitude and yours? Let's think about that. Where is my heart? Where are my affections? This story was related regarding the late Brother Guy in Woods' his father. Now, you know, brethren, a lot of us, especially preachers and those who've studied the Bible a lot, we've looked at Brother Woods' books and reference works. They've been a great blessing to the brotherhood through the years. And it's been said that he's the most quoted man that is uninspired man in the brotherhood today. It may be true. He was a great godly man, but his father, George Woods, was a dedicated Christian. It said that the elder brother Woods did not have to miss worship at all until he became an old man. And on that Lord's Day that he had to miss because of his health, they said that he just broke down and cried because he had to miss. Now, there was a man that loved God and worshiped. He loved to worship God. Again, this is not against people who are physically unable to be in all the services. The Lord knows who they are. And, and we should know as Christians. But even when we're here, friends, you and I, I'll say we, all of us, we need to ask this question. Do I really love to worship God even when I'm here? Is my heart in it like it should be? As we conclude this morning, I'd like to go back to the book of Genesis. Beautiful story here in Genesis 29, 20. Of course, we remember the story of uh, Jacob who loved Rachel, the daughter of Laban. And how that he labored seven years to gain her as his wife. And then old Laban tricked him and gave him his oldest daughter, Leah. And uh, he had to agree to work seven more years to finally get Rachel. But he did, was able to marry her a week later, but he had to fulfill that commitment. Here was a man that he loved Rachel so much that he was willing to work like that. In Genesis 29, 20, the Bible says... And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. You know, friends, I believe that's a great statement. I know it is it's in the Bible. But when you really love something or you love someone, it's not doldrum, it's not drudgery, it's not boredom. The seven years seemed like a few days to him. Because he loved Rachel that much. Now I started this lesson saying how that we should love God even more than our family. Shouldn't we love the Lord even more than Joseph loved Rachel? If we serve the Lord like that for many years on this earth, and we give it all we've got when we get to the end, will it not seem but just a few days to us? because of the love that we have for Christ. Do we love Him like that? That it's not, it's not drudgery to us. We do what we do because we want to. As we think about these things this morning, there's a song in the songbook we're going to sing here in a few moments. 
Have thine affections been nailed to the cross? Is thy heart right with God? Now that's a powerful question right there. If my heart is right with God, it's going to be right up there with Him and His Son, Jesus Christ, in heaven. Even while I'm on this earth. My affection for sin and this world and the things of this earth are going to be nailed to the cross. Paul said that we cannot belong to Christ otherwise. He said, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. The word crucify is a powerful word. That's what we have to do when it comes to the affections of this world and lusts. We've got to crucify it. But God forbid that I should glory saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world, Paul said. Galatians 6, 14. Now there's a man who crucified the affections and lusts and truly belonged to Jesus Christ. My friends, this morning, if we should have any here who need to come to the Lord, we must come in faith to Him. Hebrews 11 and 6. Believing in Him with all of our heart and repentance. Acts 2.38 Confessing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8.37 And then arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22.16 Being bathed in the blood of Jesus, our soul will be clean. Have we done that? Have we realize that our affections have not been nailed to the cross? And this morning we want to repent and to pray God's forgiveness, Acts 8.22 and we want to come back. You have that privilege while we stand, we stand.